most of the times a effort like this inside of a large company, we've seen this, for example, we'll, we'll go back to Kodak. You know, Kodak developed the digital camera. They made it in-house. They invented it. They had all the patents. And they failed to operationalize that and bring it to market because it was something that they viewed as being in competition to their core business. What we see here from Tesla is not only are they operating this company like its own startup inside of Tesla, kind of like a, you know, a Google moonshot project. I think that Elon is one of the few leaders who is capable of allowing this project, not only giving it the resources that it needs and the room to breathe, but really as the core focus long term to grow this product from something that will start out as a small and people will say inconsequential part of their business, something that can eclipse the overall size of the rest of the business in the long term. And he has that vision of how that trajectory plays out over time and the commitment to stick with it. A lot of companies, a project like this being inside of a large company, it would kill it. But I think that Tesla is an exception to that rule because normally you can see and make those arguments that, hey, you know, they have all the resources that they need to be successful, but then you watch them from the external point of view and those things don't actually happen. And it's because of internal dynamics inside the company that prevent it from working. And I don't think that, that Tesla is going to fall prey to those types of internal dynamics because Elon has created such a different organization from a cultural standpoint that knows how to maintain that fresh day zero thinking like, um, you know, Jeff Bezos talks about that is also long-term focused and able to execute over the long-term on something that is completely new and outside of the existing, I would say, P&L or balance sheet, you know, the the major business lines and categories. So, yeah, I wanted to, to point that out. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's not just um, <clears throat> that it's going to succeed. It's actually the progress. It's unbelievable that in just two years, you went from this thing that they were just playing with to here. But I love the way that he pointed out that this is built on the shoulders of all of the technology and experience that the company has, not only in Tesla, but in SpaceX as well. Mm -hmm. And then they come together, they, you know, they're single minded and they have this progress. Now, one of the statements he does say later, which is like, you know, there's that list. He created this list of all the things that made them successful and they made them be able to make this progress. Then he said, when the time is right, our manufacturing lines will be added to that list. Uh, so I was a little, there's a little confusing here, right? What does he mean that our manufacturing lines will be added to this list? So he basically has a list of what made this progress possible, the great, great team, uh, great bureaucratic free operating structure, you have the AI training, you've got all these technology, uh, you got your CEO, and eventually the manufacturing lines. I, I take that to mean that once the bot is now in full scale production, then the manufacturing, the fact that they have manufacturing lines that no one else does, is going to make them just completely separated from any other company out there. Um, or did you take that to mean that, oh, we're going to be able to test this in the manufacturing lines? So my my interpretation of this statement is that there are still aspects of the prototyping development phase that are not complete and they are they don't feel like they're ready to be overwhelmed with the number of bots that they have. I think this is supported by the positions that they're hiring for that you know they're trying to have these well, one the, even the fact that they have that teleoperation effort where they have this very low latency thing where a person can operate the bot remotely. Um, these types of things signal to me that the overall control system for the bot, that it's really the brains that they are working on. And that the, because you don't need more bots, you know, just like an unlimited number of bots where at some point they will be able to crank these out at hundreds of thousands a year, probably millions a year. Um, and the design is made so that physically they can manufacture in that scale basically very easily. Um, but you don't need to manufacture that many if for the time being you're bottlenecked by having to do training that relies on 
human labor, just like in the early days of the autopilot team, you know, they had to have, and they still have a labeling team. Um, it's not that they have done away with it, but they have managed to scale the auto labeling effort in a way that's not dependent just on the number of people that they have. And I think that right now the training of Optimus Bot is going to go through a phase where the software of Optimus um, is dependent on scaling of human trainers, uh, you know, whether you want to call them senseis or, you know, whatever, that there's going to be human in the loop training for a season. And that during that time, you don't need 10,000 Optimus bots. You only need, you know, a few hundred, a few thousand potentially. Um, and so while they're ready in the long term to be able to manufacture tons of them, once they have the software perfected, that for the next year, I think, you know, manufacturing progress will be slower um, and we'll just be looking at what is the software capable of. That said, so that's, you know, that is a, a thought that lives in one half of my brain. The thought that lives in the other half of my brain is watching people like Figure AI and, you know, Google's DeepMind continue to put out research in the embodied artificial intelligence space based on these multimodal uh, LLM architectures that they then give uh, a body to. And it's very impressive the amount of capability they have and uh you know they can come they have an understanding of the world already they are able to do complex long-term planning um but i think that there's a lot of work to be done still on the safety and repeatability that where as you might be able to get it, one of those systems four out of five or three out of six times whatever to accomplish something autonomously in a way that is sufficient. Um, I think, you know, if you want to put this in a manufacturing setting in a factory for Tesla, it needs to be able to do that, you know, without any hiccups or failures, basically over the course of an eight hour shift. And so that repeatability uh, is going to be a challenge that they have to solve in order for this to be something that is really useful um, in a manufacturing setting. And I think that that's going to be still the first application that they really focus on. Um, it's got to do that well before they're going to start generalizing beyond that use case. Um, and so, yeah, I think that my my interpretation is that we're still going to be somewhat limited on the um, application and training of the software of Optimus for, for a while still. Um, and that once they pass that point, then they'll go ahead and put the pedal to the metal on just growing manufacturing for Optimus and that the inflection will be incredible. They'll go from, you know, making a few hundred or a few thousand of these to just pumping them out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions in a relatively, uh, a ramp that's much, 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 much faster than we've seen with vehicles. Yeah. I, all of that's right. And then, um, but, yeah, the, I said the list will include the manufacturing lines. This is the list of things that's going to, why they were able to progress so quickly, because this is something that a few other companies have. So that's great to see yeah. this. Um, he says, Tesla is one of the very rare places on earth with all the critical ingredients to make this actually happen and the potential to shape a future of abundance for everyone. This is a very big statement. Um, I think we, us Tesla retail investors are very familiar, aware of this, but it really is true, and it's hard for others to understand. We compare so many Tesla bots with so many other bots out there, and you see how great they look, but you have to stop and think. Do they have the brains? Do they have the hands? Do they have the manufacturing lines? So they can build this at scale. Do they have the supercomputers to build, you know, to build the AI required to teach? Do they have the, the team? You know, and if you're a startup, you don't have the funding to support yourself versus Tesla, this is just you know, a, a small little blip in their, in their funding that they've got. Okay. So then machine says this, right? He pointed out this one sentence in that list that uh, Milan had, and he said, listen to the sentence, end-to-end -end neural nets for humanoid robots ever demonstrated to autonomously perform tasks requiring coordinated control of humanoid torso, 
arms, and full hands with fingers. Hmm, why did he not say that this end-to-end -end neural net is also helping for the legs and balancing? So Phil, this guy named Phil Truby, says, you're probably right. End-to-end -end is harder than it sounds. It takes humans who have like seven times orders of magnitude faster learning rates about a year to learn how to walk. Walking is hard. The machine says, yes, I did my PhD in human biomechanics, especially in control of lower extremities and challenging balancing tasks. It will be the most difficult challenge for bipedal robots. So I'm specifically focused on its progress and looking for uh, verbiage like this to better understand. You replied and said, I have to agree with your interpretation of the statement above. They probably have not solved end-to-end -end control from the hips down yet. And this statement is also very important. We've improved our locomotion stack, frequently walking off gantry without falls and with a faster, increasingly more human-like walking gait. Uh, also known as, this thing is not ready to operate in a factory without falling down far too often to be useful. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that machine is right to point out that they're not using end-to-end -end there, which means that those are still um, networks that are hand-coded. They are, you know, software 1.0 and written with heuristics. Um, and that is a very difficult way to write this. Obviously, you know, one of the things that we know, people always talk about how good Boston Dynamics is in the Atlas robot. But what they don't realize is that so often, you know, they have written these advanced programs for these things and they go to record them and you get to see the one time that it worked correctly out of tons and tons of times when the thing fell over and it didn't, you know, uh, it lost its balance. It wasn't able to complete the task, whatever it was. And so they can do something where, you know, you can edit a video together out of a thousand takes and make it look like it's able to do this thing in a very seamless way. And that's just not how the heuristic code performs on a functional day-to-day -day basis. And so that's what I'm kind of reading from that is that frequently walking off gantry doesn't mean that it's always walking without, and when they say gantry, it's just the thing that, you know, they've got a tether on the back of the robot and it's held up by a cable um, so that if it slips, that it doesn't fall. So it's still on gantry some of the time and it doesn't have end-to-end -end control of its legs, its hips, its lower spine, and all of those things are necessary for it to move around anywhere. I think they're not going to solve it until they get that done end to end. And then once they solve it, they need to get the reliability of it to where it's not frequently walking off gantry. It's always walking off gantry. It needs to always walk off gantry and it needs to never fall. Once you can go always off gantry and never fall, well, then you've got something that you can really work with. 